Okay. Welcome to week 26 humanities. Don't forget to turn in your week 25 HLAs by photo to your academic team. Week 26 memory work. When I say these aloud, you can say them aloud at home and I will tell you when to start by saying ready, begin. Ready, begin. Sensitivity is using my senses to perceive the true attitudes and emotions of others. I listen to others fully. I watch facial expressions. I notice tone of voice. I put myself in others' shoes. I show that I care. This is the introduction to the human body song and you can find it on your Google Drive over here with the link um, and that will give you the actual song. I am going to just say these words aloud with you and read them here on the screen. Ready, begin. Cells that work together in your body form tissues. Tissues form the organs, organs form systems in you. These systems work together to keep your body alive. The nervous system makes them all react so you'll survive. These systems are keeping you alive. Respiratory system uses oxygen you breathe. In circulatory, blood is pumping by heartbeat. Some waste is excreted through the urinary tract. Hormones come from endocrine and immune will attack. These systems are keeping you alive. Our bodies, they are different for reproductive means. Digest for food absorption, but we eat too much, it seems. The skeletal connects the bones by the ligaments. The muscular, like levers, all control the bone movements. These systems are keeping you alive. Math cheers. Ready, begin. People learn to like math, and I'm on that positive path. Mathematical thinking is if-then thinking and helps me in everyday life. Visualizing math helps me see the way each problem is supposed to be. Checking my work again is better for my brain. Six reasons people miss math problems. Ready, begin. Visualizing, so I imagine the math. Messiness, so I write neatly. Reading, so I carefully read the whole problem. Simple math, so I watch for my mistakes. Transferring, so I double check what I write. Concepts, and then I read it again or ask for help. Timeline dates. Ready, begin. Prehistory, first evidence of human migration from Africa to Eurasia. Stone Age, figures painted in Lascaux, France caves. 10,000 BCE, Mesopotamians developed agriculture in Fertile Crescent. 8,000 BCE, South Americans developed cave painting, textiles, and agriculture in Peru. 3,200 BCE, Sumerians invented cuneiform writing. 3000 BCE, Pharaoh Menes unified upper and lower kingdoms of Egypt. 1700 BCE, Hammurabi compiled first known law code in Babylon. 1339 BCE, King Tutankhamun entombed in Egypt's Valley of the Kings. 1300 BCE, epic story of Gilgamesh recorded early Mesopotamian culture. 1250 BCE, Greek spot Trojan War in Anatolia. 1122 BCE, Zhou Dynasty invoked Mandate of Heaven, beginning longest rule of China. 1050 BCE, Phoenicians devised phonetic alphabet. 776 BCE, Greeks held first recorded Olympic Games. 753 BCE, legendary twins Romulus and Remus founded Rome. 587 BCE, Nebuchadnezzar II captured Jerusalem and destroyed its temple. 563 BCE, Prince Siddhartha, later known as Buddha, born in India. 539 BCE, Babylon fell to Persian King Cyrus the Great. 522 BCE, Chinese philosopher Confucius initiated teaching of ethics. 509 BCE, Roman Republic replaced monarchy. 508 BCE, Athenians instituted first democracy. 500 BCE, Greek mathematician Pythagoras proposed round earth theory. 480 BCE, classical period began, influenced by Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. 330 BCE, Alexander the Great's conquests spread Greek culture into Egypt and Asia. 
221 BCE, Qin Dynasty began con constructing Great Wall along China's northern border. 44 BCE, Julius Caesar assassinated in Rome on the Ides of March. 27 BCE, Octavian installed as first Roman emperor. 3 BCE, Jesus Christ born in Bethlehem, Judea. 79 CE, Mount Vesuvius erupted, destroying Pompeii. 476 CE, Western Roman Empire collapsed. I think I might have said BCE for 79, 79 CE. This is our poem for this month, Mark Antony's Funeral Oration from the play Julius Caesar by Shakespeare. When we read it, we'll try to read it with expression and I will um, say ready, begin, and we'll start with the title all the way at the beginning. Ready, begin. Mark Antony's Funeral Oration from the play Julius Caesar by Shakespeare. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often turred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was, Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man, so are they all, all honorable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor hath cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the looper call, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambitious? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and my men have lost their reason. Bear with me, my heart is in the coffin there with Caesar and I must pause till it come back to me. Here's our Roman Europe, our Western Europe song. Uh, these are the uh, areas that Rome ended up moving into after this time period that we're studying in history. So we're learning the names of the modern countries. I will go ahead and use my laser pointer so we can sing and try to point out the locations at the same time. Ready, begin. Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Switzerland. Austria, Belgium, and Netherlands, France and Monaco, Germany, are all in Western Europe. That's our last week singing that song and doing that recitation. So study up while you wait. Welcome to week 26 character. This is our last week studying this character trait. So let's go ahead and work on saying it again one more time. Ready, begin. Sensitivity is using my senses to perceive the true attitudes and emotions of others. I listen to others fully. I watch facial expressions. I notice tone of voice. I put myself in others' shoes. I show that I care. We're going to be focusing on that I am sensitive to facial expressions part today. One thing that we are looking at are all these faces. Now this is one person, but they've done nine different facial expressions. And how do you think each person feels? And when you figure that out, it helps you understand how other people might be feeling with that facial expression. So um, I'll give you a chance to pause it and figure out, go by one person by one person, what does one number one feel? What do you think number one feels? What do you think number two feels? What do you think number three feels? What do you th think number four feels? What do you think number five feels? What do you think number six feels? 
What do you think number seven feels? What do you think number eight feels? And what do you think number nine feels? Try to figure that out. I know there, I didn't give you a lot of emotion words on this one, but it's interesting to me because some of these aren't changed very much, right? Um, if we just look at the difference between number three and number five, she looks pretty, you know, cheerful in number three and then kind of not cheerful in number five, but they're just a tiny change in her expression. But when you can figure out what your own emotions look like on your face, that will help you figure out how to help other people or how to think about approaching other people when you look at expressions on their faces. Very helpful. So you can think about that question in blue. How would you react? And that's how other people might react. Welcome to week 26 Humanities for art, music, and timeline dates. This week I have a music appreciation um, link down below that is called the One Minute Overview. It's optional, but it's a cool resource. It gives you um, a background on Handel's Messiah a little bit. And then of course you can click on the button and that will play the music and you can watch the performance. I'm gonna go over a couple of vocabulary terms today. Um, this is uh, the basic words for this week are chorus and oratorio. So first let's talk about chorus. Now this is Handel's Messiah being performed and as you can tell, there are people on the um, lots, hundreds of people up here on the stage performing in the choir and down here in the symphony or the orchestra. A chorus is any vocal music that is performed as a part of a larger work. Okay, it's sung by two different people or more than two. Of course, you can see here that it's way more than two people. Um, but the, the different voices are going to play different parts called like, you know, bass and alto and mezzo and soprano. Um, and those, uh, there are many other different parts, depending on how complicated you get. And the different musical parts played to or sang together at the same time is a chorus. Well, along with that, you can have a chorus in an opera or in an oratorio. And here we have it in oratorio. Oratorios are large musical productions, but they're only for producing in a performance um, like this, not musical theater. So as you can tell on the stage, we don't have anybody dressed up in costumes. There isn't anybody, you know, acting out um, their parts. Um, but we will have soloists that walk forward and have a solo piece. And that solo piece is called an aria. And the solos will actually be um, sang by people who are acting out a character or, or taking the role of one character. So just like in a play, you have different people uh, say lines or sing lines that will um, represent their character. You'll have that in this large oratorio also. It just isn't necessarily accompanied with you know, costumes that are different and people moving around stage. They're gonna say where they're at and they might walk forward if they have a solo, but they will um, be part of this large choral group and stay as just a unified group. Um, so that is the difference between an opera because an opera has many different costumes, many different um, people moving around stage. It's, it's a full fledged musical theater piece Whereas an oratorio, everybody stays put and they stay um, as just uh, in their same uniform. Um, Messiah's uh, piece, oh, I might be getting music, okay. Um, this Messiah piece is, you know, like I've told you before, is, is a history of uh, the biblical account of God's promises as, you know, told by the prophets. And it ends with Christ's glorification going up into heaven, well, this was such a moving piece. It was so powerful when it was written originally that King George II um, heard the end, of, as the end of the song started to come, he stood up and he was so moved and he remained standing um, until the very end because he was just so enraptured by the music. And when he stood up, everybody in the whole room had to stand up because that was a tradition. It still is royals. If they stand, then then the people around them also stand. So when the monarch stands, so he being the king stood up and now 
it's been almost 300 years since this was written and people still stand up at the end of the of the piece as a way of showing respect um, for the, the amazing music. So it's still a tradition people do today. In the music, you'll see a harpsichord, you'll hear a harpsichord being played. And the harpsichord is one of the, you know, first pianos. It's a stringed instrument. There are strings that are tight here and they're being plucked as you push on the keys here. The string is plucked up here inside the piano or in the, inside the harpsichord. And that plucking that happens creates a music and those um, strings are tightened to the right exact degree and they, they can sound very lovely. And so I gave you a video down here that's optional about the harpsichord. What is the harpsichord? And, um, it, you know, we don't use it necessarily as much anymore, but different countries used it um, back in the 16th to 18th centuries, especially, and it was written into the song, A Handel's Messiah. So very interesting. As part of our classroom practice in school, we have been using the solfege method of singing and my um, technology setup doesn't allow me to hear this setup right now, but um, you can sing with this. So if you click on this button, it will let you sing do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do and back down. And then I also included um, these kind of practices here. So exercise 23 and 24, and you can just listen to those as many times as you want to. The good thing about using these is that you are uh, like able to do that at home in private. So go ahead and click on those and enjoy the um, practice in, in, there at your house in private. There are five, I think, uh, practices plus the original. So do the first one several times first, just like we do in class, and then you can move on to the practices. Enjoy. For art appreciation, we're talking about the Pantheon still. This is our monthly theme. This is the last week we're going to talk about it. So I gave you this really fun link to go to uh, the website 360 Cities. It's a place where you can explore places all over the world, many, many places, and you will get to um, go pretend like you're inside of it and look around 360 degrees all around you. It's really fantastic. And our timeline date this week is um, the, I'll read it to you, 27 BCE, Octavian installed as first Roman emperor. Well, having an emperor is a very big deal, right? Um, and so this transformation from having a republic where we had people uh, who were in charge of the people, now we have a, a monarch or an emperor or a, a tribune, a leader. And um, when this started to happen, chaos was breaking out. Rome was just filled with chaos and violence. And, um, you know, Julius Caesar had been assassinated. Mark Antony had been defeated. And Octavian had risen up as the leader. And he needed to figure out a way to stop the violence and stop the chaos and get things back orderly. And so he reacted really strongly by strengthening the military. He, um, this is kind of our main theme for today, uh, Roman military. He got a permanent uh, army, which is for land, and navy, which is uh, soldiers that are used on water, called sailors. So this army, navy, permanent entity um, ended up, uh, you know, becoming part of Rome. But Octavian made that all of the soldiers and sailors swear allegiance not to Rome, but to Octavian himself. So they were supposed to do what was supposed to be best for Octavian, not necessarily the best for Rome. And so that really changed things. Um, Octavian needed to gain support from these soldiers and sailors. And the way he did that was um, after they got out of their military service, um, he would give them land. Or if they already had land, he would give them booty. Booty is a fun word, but that just means that all the loot that they had stolen on their conquests, um, he would give them that booty. So here's a boat. You can see um, what a Roman uh, possible army boat would have looked like back then. Um, really amazing the way he did this. Um, at the time, there was supposed to be a coalition or a, a teamwork between three different rulers, Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus. But um, uh, these three leaders um, were taken out and 
uh, Octavian elected a consul or a council of people to lead all by himself. He didn't ask for people to elect leaders. He himself elected those leaders. And that changed things. You know, he gave himself a whole bunch of titles. One of them, of course, was emperor, but another one was tribune for life. Um, he was saying, I will be your representative. Don't worry, guys, I've got you. And he said that for the plebeians who were the poor, lower class, which means that people from the poor class were not representing themselves. Um, they were going to be represented by Octavian and then instead of anybody else. And um, so back to that timeline date, 27, that's the year that Octavian laid down his power. And then the Senate said, no, 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 you have to take your powers back. And that was, remember, because of the the star. They had believed that um, that maybe the gods had designed the fact that Octavian could be leader. And the Senate said, no, you can be the Augustus or the divine leader. So I'm going to talk about more of that in just a second as we get into our topic for today. But welcome to week 25, Roman military humanities theme today. Of course, you're welcome to take notes. This is what we work on in class. Um, Cornell notes format would be ideal, um, but we're in quarantine, so you have that option. Um, and so now I'm going to talk about the topic bread and circuses, but it's directly tied to Octavian. Okay, so bread and circuses is a topic, but let's think about Octavian again. He named himself Pontifex Maximus, which means that not only does he have power over the military and the government, but he is now going to say that he has all the power over religious observances, the Roman gods, and how people worship the Roman gods. And that means he had government and religion, and all of that power was his, which is a lot of power. He, be, he, he ended up taking the rights to begin the Senate meetings, to speak first at the Senate meetings, to veto or stop anybody else's um, laws, um, he also proposed legislation or new laws. He was the one that proposed those laws. It was supposed to be a place where people could come up and suggest things, but he is now the leader of the Senate. Big deal. And um, he ended up wanting to become popular, right? Because clearly he tried to be popular with his military to give them land and whatnot. And he's taken all this power. So the people are thinking, no, he's not a good guy. And they want to revolt. So in order to avoid this, he comes up with a new policy. He is going to get popular by putting in this policy called bread and circuses. So this is when he distributes free food, bread, or entertainment, the Colosseum and the gladiatorial fights, and cash, actual money, to lower class people. And he decides this is going to make him popular, which it worked for a while. Here's a really cool video on it. Um, the video is a, a kind of a student's overview of what Bread and Circuses was. And here's a quote. We have this actual quote written from that time. The evil was not in Bread and Circuses per se, but in the willingness of the people to sell their rights as free men for full bellies and the excitement of the games which would serve to distract them from the other human hungers, which bread and circuses can never appease. So we have this, you know, uh, idea that if my belly is full and if I'm excited by the games, maybe I won't notice that my freedoms are being taken away. Maybe I won't notice the other, you know, f things in my heart that I feel like I need. There's another great quote from Juvenal. And I'll read it through you slowly with you. Um, plays, which are like theater plays. Farces, which are like jokes, lots of funny things. I think of maybe memes off the internet or funny videos off the internet. Spectacles, funny things to, shocking things to look at. Uh, gladi gladiators, you know, football players or basketball players or soccer players. Um, strange beasts. Uh, medals, like awards, pictures, and other such opiates or drugs, these were for ancient peoples the bait towards slavery, towards slavery. 
and the price of their liberty, the instruments of tyranny. So he is saying that the things that are going to get people enticed and excited about going into slavery to give up their freedoms are things like being entertained, having awards and, and anything that's a spectacle and exciting. Um, and you, if you're so excited and distracted, will just give up your, your freedoms possibly. So all those different distractions that he referred to are things that we don't necessarily have the exact distraction in 2020, but we might have something like that, right? Do we have, so the question that I would ask in class and I'd love you to discuss at home is do we have plays and spectacles and other distractions today that make us kind of, you know, lose our freedoms as people? Does that happen to us? Uh, so Juvenile said, uh, you know, give them bread and circuses and they will never revolt. And basically this policy is so that people will stop trying to revolt and get their freedoms back. So bread and circuses was a big deal. And, um, and I think that um, at the end of the day, we don't want to be people who are distracted, right? So here's another good discussion question. Could government leaders prevent uh, people from revolting by offering them something like bread and circuses today? Could that happen? Or any leader, really. It doesn't have to be a government leader. Is that something that can happen today? So there's some great discussion questions to work with at home. Our next element of our military discussion is Cleopatra. Okay, so Cleopatra we talked about before. She was the last ruler of Egypt's Ptolemaic dynasty. She ruled with her two brother husbands, brothers and husbands, named Ptolemy the 13th and 14th. And then she had a son with Julius Caesar named Caesarian, and his name is Ptolemy the 15th, and he was killed. Um, and we know that she did meet Julius Caesar, and I don't know if you know this story, but legend has it that she delivered herself rolled up in a carpet. So she had a carpet delivered to Julius Caesar, and when he unrolled the carpet, voila, there she was. And eventually they, um, you know, had a baby together, and Caesar was assassinated, and then she has this son. Later on, she married Mark Antony, who, of course, did not get the throne. And Octavian was very angry by this, and lots of drama, right? So I'm not going to go back into all of that, but just know that that Cleopatra... She was not, you know, she was of Asian or was of Arabian descent. So this would not have been what she looked like. This is just a theater production of her. But we do know that she, um, you know, that whole thing between Julius Caesar, Mark Antony and Octavian and Cleopatra caused quite a bit of military problems at the time. So she's worth mentioning here. Here she is in her sedan chair um, on the water in Alexandria uh, where the lighthouse was. Um, and she's down in Egypt. So she really kind of connected Rome and Egypt more and more. Okay, so one of the questions I have for you is how do we know all of this stuff? Where are we getting our information? Is it a primary source where we have firsthand knowledge of the situation or is it a secondary source or more where we just heard about it from someone else? Well, um, when we read a writing of someone else's, that is their history, that's a secondary source. It's a good secondary source, but it's still secondary. But a first primary source means that we are talking to people who were there. And when people are buried because of a volcano exploding over the top of them, that will end up making them a primary source. So I have kind of a sad story to talk to you about with Pompeii, but it's really interesting from a scientific perspective, okay? So there's this um, huge volcano named Vesuvius in Italy. It, it's still there today. And back in 79 um, AD, it exploded. And when it exploded, it covered this, the little town near it named Pompeii. And Pompeii was bigger than the size of Cottage Grove. It had 10,000 to 20,000 people in it. Cottage Grove has like 10,000 people. And in this city, there was a big festival going on. There may have been even more people in town. And Romans had summer homes there. It was a beautiful space. And the volcano erupted so suddenly and shockingly 
that it destroyed and killed all those people while they were in the middle of their day um, doing the different things that they do. And that means that they, when we unburied them and archaeologists unbury all of that evidence, it's a primary source. We get to see exactly what Romans were doing back in 79 AD. That is why it's so important. So with that, I, I added a couple of cool videos here. Make sure you take advantage of any of these awesome links because Pompeii is still being uncovered today. It's 2020 and we've been doing it for 300 years approximately. It's very cool. You can still go there today. Here is the location. So we know Italy is kind of shaped like a boot and Pompeii is up at the front of the ankle. Um, and it's uh, got access to the water. It's not on the water, but it's, it has water near it. And um, it, the archaeologists, uh, you know, did not know. I mean, I guess throughout history, nobody understood that Pompeii had been covered and destroyed that badly back in 79 until the 1700s. And archaeologists began to uncover it, and they realized that it was covered in 20 feet of ash. Now, your room that you're in is probably about 10 feet tall. The ceiling is probably about 10 feet tall. If you imagine 10 and 10 more, so 20 feet of ash piled on top of the city, the pressure and the heavy weight of all of that is going to help preserve all of the buildings and paintings and houses, workshops, bakeries, ovens, all kinds of things were discovered every element of the culture. Um, it's one of the most popular tourist places in Italy because you can still go there. And so here's a picture. You can go to these ruins and see everything that there is to discover. They've uncovered it. Here's Mount Vesuvius right there. You can see its top has bl been blown off as a cone up there. And when it, it was uh, blowing up, um, it is in the center of this circle, but the black ash spread all over this area. And those red dots are cities that were affected by that um, ash. And Pompeii is right here, uh, and it just got buried completely. So other sites you can also see. Um, we have done archaeology other places too, but here's some more videos. Um, National Geographic has so many cool videos. Um, there's just a lot offered there. Okay. So um, one of the pictures here is going to show you all of this city, and that was all uncovered, the cobblestone streets, the sidewalk, the gutters beside the streets. Um, I have another picture like that, more cobblestone streets, more gutters. Um, sewer water would go down these gutters. It was actually quite a nice invention that they could um, have the rain waters wash out that way. So really awesome that they can see the streets. Um, we don't have actual people that got preserved, but the the bones are still there. And when the archaeologists discovered that they, they were uncovering where a human had been, they put a little tiny hole in that part of the ground and they poured cement or plaster into the hole. And they poured so much plaster into the hole that it filled up the cavity or that the empty space in the ground. And then after it completely dried, they uncovered it slowly, and then they they ended up having actual pictures of everybody who had been, you know, that they could figure out. They have many, many, many people that they have gotten um, kind of the picture of. This is not the actual person. This is plaster, but it's the shape of what the person looked like when they died or as they um, were covered by the ash. So it is a terrible, sad thing. And obviously to see these bodies is, is sad, but for scientists, it's also a, a very interesting to kind of make their life have more meaning by helping us understand what life would have been like for Romans back then. Uh, here's a picture of a, of a bakery, um, a fire, a furnace, where they may have baked bread or pots or clay. Um, and uh, we can see all the way around that. Um, archaeologists have found this awesome restaurant this is the door to the outside over here on the right. And you walk into the restaurant and you get to come up here and there would have been big bowls and containers here of the different food um, options. And then the people who were running the restaurant would be back here behind the kitchen. And they had all these different big um, places for containers also. 
So really fantastic. These little um, decorations are made out of mosaics, which are little tiny tiles all put together so nicely. Um, really amazing. This is a mosaic, um, which is little tiny tiles that make up this face. And guess who this is? This is actually Alexander the Great. Um, and so we just, when I said we had primary source information, we really do have primary sources. You know, we have um, people who were actually there telling us the story. So now I'm going to finish up by talking about government. And we always try to talk about a vocabulary term. So welcome to week 26, government. The vocabulary term this week is government persecution. Um, and I guess that's probably not the best way to put it, but talking about our rights to have um, uh, freedom of religion. So we have this, an artist recommend a uh, rendition of these Christians who are in the Colosseum, the animals who are just about to come out of the ground. Um, we know that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of animals, maybe thousands, were um, a spectacle for people to come watch the animals kill each other in the Colosseum, and they did kill people, but they also killed animals. Um, they let animals kill each other. It was a terrible thing. And one of the, you know, after Octavian became the leader, really, uh, there was a huge increase on um, the killing of Christians because of their religion. And that, uh, you know, really amped up and became more prevalent. And I wanted to contrast that with what we have here in, in the United States, um, we have the Bill of Rights, which I've gotten to see in Washington, D.C. I hope you can go see it someday. Um, it says in the First Amendment, a paragraph, and that paragraph has many different phrases in it. I'll read the whole paragraph right now, but then we will um, break it down and just talk about the religion clause. Okay, it says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And, you know, it has this free exercise clause. It says that the government will not prohibit the free practice of religious beliefs. And it, it actually has two parts. It says that for the, the Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. <clears throat> so it won't establish or start a religion and Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. So we're not gonna start it or stop it. If it's a free exercise of peaceful religion, we're just not gonna stop it. It is vague, it's it's not very clear, and, the, and so the Constitution and the courts get to decide um, what that means. The courts get to decide what that means. So the question I wanna leave you with today is um, talking about that balance between what government wants and what religion wants. And, and should people be persecuted because of their religious beliefs? Um, and, and maybe the quick answer is no, of course not. But um, that's something that's a good discussion. You know, why? Why shouldn't they be? And um, probably should have written that on there. Why shouldn't they be? So that is the major theme of um, the discussion. And the last thing I have for you is just to remember to go check out your HLAs. If you want the links here and you're watching the video, the links are available in your drive file. You can go through all of the um, PowerPoint slides and uh, in, in the Google Slides program, and you can get a hold of uh, the links there. And so when you click on them, they'll actually go to that website for you. Okay, well, I hope you have a great day and enjoy, uh, enjoy uh, the rest of your week, okay?